Um, okay, hi everyone. This is the um, brief run through of the one second, yeah, run through of the May June 2013 AS um, economics paper three. Um, I'll just uh, touch on each question briefly for about uh, a minute or so. Uh, this will be a quick half an hour run through. Um, so, starting with question one, um, the introduction of equal pay legislation increases the wages of female workers. What's the most likely effect? Uh, so in this case, the answer is C, because we can treat um, equal pay legislation as a sort of enforced um, price uh, price floor, um, where instead of uh, market forces operating, um, the government itself has imposed a level. And according to sort of basic supply and demand analysis of the labor market, um, an increase in the price of female labour is going to increase supply as working becomes uh, more profitable um, for the female labour force, thus inducing more people, uh, more females to enter into the workforce. Therefore, there's an expansion, so it's C. Um, so question number two, we're looking at um, at what point uh, the individual will stop uh, buying the good. Uh, now we can see the, the marginal uh, utility from money um, is is quite easy to calculate. So um, with each additional good uh, costing six pounds, um, the the utility value of, in money terms is twelve. So we've got to look for the the point in the marginal utility from which um, the marginal utility of the good dips below twelve. Um, and you can see that point is from the third to the fourth good. Therefore, we've got the answer to be B, uh, three three units where the marginal utility is actually eight. Uh, whereas it's costing the the opportunity cost of that of that fourth good is actually twelve utils in this case or units of utility. Therefore, the answer to two is B. Okay, uh, three is quite uh, a difficult one, I say. But firstly, you've got to look at it in in two ways. You first got to see if um, you've got to compare the marginal physical products in S and Y and then compare it to how much they're selling it for. So you'll notice um, that for both fact, factor X. Um, what the marginal physical product is only saying is uh, the provision of an additional unit of X leads to an increase in output by two units, whereas in the case of factor Y, an increase in one unit of factor Y leads to um, an increase in output by four units. So we can see that the sort of per unit increase in output from X costs $2.50, and from Y it's also $2.50. So therefore, there's an equal per unit increase in output from X and Y. Therefore, it's not that more of X is needed or more of Y is needed. Both will be either increased or decreased. Um, and as we can see, the, the per unit cost of increasing either X or Y is two fifty, but the revenue generated will be three. Uh, so since the revenue is greater than the cost, uh, the marginal revenue is greater than the marginal yeah. cost. Um, if the firm wants to maximize its profit, it needs to equate marginal revenue with marginal cost. Thereby, it needs to increase both X and Y, i.e. Uh, A should be the selected answer. Okay, moving on to question four, we're looking at uh, diminishing marginal, marginal returns to labor. Um, now, this is quite simple to calculate, and we can clearly see that the answer is the employment of the um the third the third uh worker because initially it's seven the marginal um return then it's ten so it's actually increasing one and two but there's a decrease back to nine with the employment of the third worker so when the third worker is employed that's when uh dmr sets in i'll just quickly check this is recording yeah we're all good okay uh, so number five, the answer to this is in this case D, because the the long run accurate supply curve uh, reflects all the individual points of output, whereby the cost is the lowest possible. Um, each sort of like long run aggregate supply curve is, would be made up of uh, a series of smaller short run aggregates, like those forming an envelope. So the point X is indicating at that particular point of output. That's the minimum. Um, cost of uh, providing the good. Okay, moving on to question six. Um, so we need to look at decreasing return to scale. And if you've covered decreasing return to scale before, it's sort of analyzing um, how output changes to a, 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 an increase in a proportionate increase in capital and labor. So there's constant returns of scale, then a doubling of the capital and labor leads to a doubling of output. 
Uh, conversely, if there's decreasing returns of scale, which all the question asking, a doubling of capital and labor leads to less than double increase in output. Um, so if we look into this question, I think we can see the answer is, I'm just going to check again, but it's six is D. Um, because we can start here. Uh, we can start, um, it's probably easy to deal with it in terms of, um, I'm trying to think about how I want to do this. Yeah, we can, we, can, we can start by dealing with it in terms of output. You can see there's a doubling of output from 100 to 200. There's been a less than doubling in the inputs. Therefore, there's increasing return to scale at this point. Similarly, between 200 and 300, outputs increased by a third, and also capital and labor have increased by a third. So there's constant return to scale. From 300 to 400, outputs increased by uh, a quarter, as has capital and labor. So again, there's constant return to scale. But from 400 to 500, we can see outputs increased by a fifth, uh, where, however, uh, capital and labor have been increased by two thirds. And this is the point at which there's decreasing returns to scale. Um, so the answer is six is D. Seven, uh, we're looking at the total cost curve here. Um, now, uh, the average fixed cost is basically the total fixed cost divided by output. And since total fixed cost here is invariant with output, um, as the denominator in this case increases, the whole fraction is going to decrease. So we know that average fixed cost will decrease. Uh, simply because we can see that total costs are increasing um, through, the, um, through the graph. That therefore implies that the variable cost must be increasing to because uh, total cost is equal to fixed cost plus variable cost. So to warrant this increase in total cost, there must be an increase in average variable costs because the fixed cost is, is staying the same, essentially. Um, number eight, what is most likely to pose a threat to size of small bakeries? Um, so you can probably check the mark scheme on this, but the answer in this case is B, because we can sort of see mass-produced bread and small bakeries as like uh, rival competing firms or substitute goods. So if the, the price of, of mass bread falls, or is, is in this case cheaper, uh, consumers would generally switch over to these, uh, these mass-produced uh, bread supermarkets or whatever, and therefore the small local bakeries will suffer a fall in demand and uh, a possible bankruptcy. If I were to touch on the other answers in this question, A, the effect is really minimal, uh, though I think in all cases, to some extent, there is an effect on the survival, but I don't think advertising is a big issue, nor is the diseconomies of scale. I'd say that's probably this, the second most likely, if anything, um, because it's going to increase costs and put a squeeze on margins, and again, congestion, very minimal effect. Um, okay, so question nine. Uh, with a perfectly elastic demand curve, that's, um, that's, that'll be horizontally uh, it'll be a, ho a horizontal curve. And therefore, um, when we think of price elastic demand curve, when we think of a price elasticity of demand, it's the percentage change in quantity over the percentage change in, uh, in price. And that's the idea that, um, in, in this case, with perfectly elastic, that, that value is uh, infinite. Uh, a small change in price is, just, uh, is dramatically going to, a small increase in price is going to bring revenue down to zero because the quantity will fall all the way down to zero. Um, and therefore no revenue will be made. And conversely, just, just to discuss it a bit further, there's no reason why the firm would ever decrease the price uh, because that, they, they can, there's a, the, 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 that would um, uh, worsen revenue as well. But moving back to the question, um, an increase in price will cause revenue to fall to zero because it's, it's perfectly elastic. Consumers will immediately switch uh, away from that good to whatever substitute is out there and all uh, demand will fall to zero. Um, okay, question 10. So it's a switch from perfect competition to profit maximization. Um, and you can sort of draw this out graphically, um, but uh, it's the idea that the, the a monopoly is going to charge uh, like a higher price uh, than, the, um, than, than what would be there in perfect competition. Because in perfect competition, as we know, there's, there's technically zero profit, marginal revenue equals marginal cost, but uh, monopolies make positive profits. So there's a higher price and uh, there's also a restricted output. So the answer in this case is, uh, is B. This is how the, 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 um, the monopoly essentially makes that, that positive profit because the, the price um, in a perfect competition is always going to be such that all firms will make a zero profit. The price is gradually eroded down to that.
Now, uh, number 11, um, this is like a simple sort of definition kind of question. So it's, um, it's essentially D. Um, it, this is sort of similar to what I was touching on with a monopoly question where uh, the price, the, the profit is just really required to keep uh, the resources in the present use. That's essentially saying like all resources to some extent have an opportunity cost. Um, essentially, even even labor. So if um, the profit in say working in a firm is eight hundred thousand um, dollars, and that's the just equal to zero profit, that means that the opportunity cost of say someone's labor. Uh, working in the next best opportunity is equal to eight hundred thousand dollars, and therefore that's that's the profit that's just enough to keep their resources in in its present use. It doesn't necessarily have to equal zero, but if you factor an opportunity cost, then it does equal zero. So the answer in this case is D. Um, Twelve. Um, so we can see that the quantity is limited initially at Q, um, and at Q we've got um, we have to look at it in terms of consumer and producer surplus. So if there's a change from initially this restricted quantity Q to the market at equilibrium quantity, we can see the consumer surplus um, is going to increase by V and producer surplus, um, is, which was initially somewhat around, I'm gonna just quickly map out this triangle with my uh, mouse. It's now increased by W. So there's the increasing consumer surplus by V and producer surplus by W, um, meaning the answer in terms of the net gain in welfare is C. Uh, v plus W. Um, question 13. So there's been a shift in this um, like negative income tax schedule curve. It's become slightly steeper, which means that there's um, a, mo a more a more generous sort of rate, uh, like tax rebate as income falls, and uh, a more harsh like increase in, in tax as income increases. And what essentially that is going to worsen incentives because for a given level of income, um, once the the NT schedule is positive, more of the, the level of greater, therefore there's less incentive to work, so incentives worsen. However, there's a there's a more generous tax rebate um, when the NT schedule is negative, uh, implying that equity will improve. So we get to see a worsening of incentives and improvement in equity. Um, 14, so we're looking at how to improve GNP per head. Um, a is clearly not right because GNP per head actually accounts for the difference in population size between countries. Um, B, uh, that's not it either because it's uh, it's already real GNP per head. Uh, it's already accounted for different inflation rates. Um, and I think, although it doesn't actually specify whether it's using market exchange, actually purchasing power parity is actually better than use of market exchange rate because that affects in fact different costs of living. Uh, between countries. So the answer is actually C, uh, because um, in terms of standard living, although sort of um, GNP per head may be similar, if a lot more of that GNP is made up from the hidden economy where uh, it's unregulated, there isn't any sort of like labor protection, uh, that is, uh, and that can actually lead to vast discrepancy in standard of living, especially if you're, wor if you're working on the margins. Um, as opposed to a, like a regulated proper industry. So the answer is C. Um, 15, uh, which combination of circumstances is most likely to lead to an increase? Um, so if, we, if I just touch on unemployment initially, um, a rise in unemployment is more likely to in, uh, lead to an increase in budget deficit because um, uh, a large portion of uh, like government spending is made up of uh, transfer payments, so benefits, all that sort of stuff. And as unemployment increases, there are being increased in unemployment payouts. Similarly, the tax, the, the tax revenue falls as more people lose their jobs and therefore they're, they're not paying tax. So an un, a rise in unemployment is what's going to lead to initially um, an increase in the budget deficit. Um, and we can sort of isolate A and B from here. Um, and clearly, an, a decrease in government spending isn't going to warrant a, uh, a government budget cut. So therefore, the answer to 15 is B. Uh, now, um, injections will already occur in the circular flow of income model if, firstly, investment, which is uh, money coming in from the private sector, is greater than savings, which is uh, private individuals depositing funds, taking funds out of the circular flow into uh, financial institutions and intermediaries. Uh, so this should be no. Similarly, if um, taxation is greater than government spending, there's actually a net um, leakage from this circular flow of income model as the government is actually taking money out um, and is boosting their surplus. So this should be no. 
Um, and if exports are greater than imports, that implies more money is coming in um, to the economy than going out to foreign economies. So this should be yes, the answer is B. Um, 17, so this is a, like a, a calculation question. You first have to, um, using the marginal parenthesis scheme, you can work out the multiplier. Uh, the multiplier is equal to one over one minus uh, the MPC, which is one over 0 0.1, which is 10. Uh, once you know the multiplier and the desired level of income increase, um, you can work out the initial injection required. Um, with the multiplier being 10, and you want to increase income by $20 million, uh, you need a 25 by a $2 million increase um, in investment to achieve this full employment level, um, which is 17 is A. Um, 18, again, this is sort of like a, a simple, just got to uh, learn it sort of question. Uh, induced investment is what's going to increase um, via the um, acceler initial accelerator mechanism. And therefore, the multiplier is what's going to cause that increase in, in national income. Uh, 19, so a, uh, a rise in interest rates um, is going to lead to a fall in bonds because bonds and uh, bond prices and the yield on bonds or i.e. the interest rate are inversely related um, therefore the rise is going to rise in interest rates um, which is going to increase demand for savings and other money instruments and so uh, demand for bonds is going to fall relative to say savings and therefore the fall in demand is a fall in price um, we can see that A is um, not correct because uh, a rise in interest rate at least the hot money flows into the economy causing appreciation. So the demand for money actually decreases from a rise in interest rate uh, due to increased borrowing costs. Uh, question 20, um, an increase in public sector but not vehicle. Um, the answer to this one is B because um, if, the, if the government's running a deficit, it can fund that through the sale of um, government bonds um, and usually these bonds are bought by the central bank who print money uh, to then purchase these bonds. But if the purchase of these bonds is funded, so in second. Yeah, sorry for that. Um, if the, um, the bonds aren't being bought by the central bank, but being bought by private individuals, then the, the, the central bank isn't printing any more money. Uh, therefore, the answer to this question is B. Liquidity preference is, again, a, a definition question, but it's all to do with the relative demand for money versus other assets such as bonds and stock. Um, and the interest rate is in, inherently linked to the whole liquidity preference idea um, I discussed earlier. Uh, question 22. This is simply a question where you just go through each and cross things out. Um, by fact that it's a developing uh, country, uh, is synonymous with uh, rather higher birth rates as sort of contraceptive um, and sort of uh, family planning information hasn't yet been um, fully developed in the economy. And you'd think it'd be more of a secondary manufacturing sector that's uh, prevalent, so it's not A. So the capital intensive uh, production is a feature of uh, a developed country rather than a developing, though the rapidly growing population is uh, more relevant, but it's not B. Similarly, low death rate, you wouldn't necessarily expect that in a developing country. Um, and the debt, um, that's quite a difficult one to determine. It's more likely to be D because of labour intensive production to go with the, the secondary manufacturing injury and low rates of savings as people aren't yet earning high enough amounts of income um, to sort of carry that over. So the answer to that one is D. Uh, 23, um, increase in cyclical unemployment is obviously going to be. Um, compulsory redundancies is obviously going to uh, uh, contribute into increase in uh, cyclical unemployment. So it's definitely an increase in this part. Um, and if voluntary resignations make up a, a large portion of, of the redundancies, um, then it's not really going to have a big impact on cyclical unemployment. So therefore, voluntary resignation decrease and compulsory redundancy increase is what's going to cause the increase in cyclical unemployment. Uh, 24. Uh, this is again a sort of definition question you should know what to include in cost benefit analysis and all of these things crime rates mental health and work skills have um, an economic impact and therefore they all need to be factored into any cost benefit analysis um 25 um you can sort of treat this as a um like a sort of short run agri supply curve with uh, the rate of interest being included on the left 
Um, but the answer to this one is essentially C, because this is, I don't know if you've covered the Phillips curve uh, yet, but um, increases in like expected future rates of inflation means for like a, a given level of output, they expect a higher rate of inflation. And that expectations is what caused, say, workers to bargain for higher wages uh, and prices to therefore increase and actually cause the left of shift in the supply curve slash Phillips curve. So the answer to that one is C. Um, so trade unions um, and the extent of their power, that's all to do with the supply side because uh, if there's an increase, if there's a reduction in power of um, uh, legal reforms to reduce, have reduced inflationary pressure because um, the central part of the trade union directly links the extent to which um, wages uh, move freely if they're sort of um, determined by supply and demand, then wages aren't sticky, they can move quite quickly quite easily, whereas if trade unions are prominent, um, the predominant source of, of, of wage uh, determination is um, bargaining, wage bargaining between uh, employers and trade unions. This makes um, wages quite sticky um, and affects the supply side, uh, because the supply side is all to do with how, uh, sorry, one second. I guess it will purchase Okay, uh, apologies for that, but as I was saying, the extent of the power of the trade unions is a uh, supply side uh, policy because it's directly affecting how uh, sort of wages and inflation then uh, link to output. Uh, Twenty-seven. This is quite a simple question. You know, in a uh, tertiary sec, uh, you know, in a uh, developed country, the tertiary sector, services, uh, finance, that's going to be the most prevalent. And as we can see, uh, in prime, like, sort of synonymously, the primary industry, agriculture, fishing, all of that is going to be at its lowest. So we can see the answer to that is A. Um, in the case of uh, a free floating exchange rate, um, the normal exchange rate is allowed to, is, is variable changing, so we know it's either A or B. Um, and it, it's only in the case of um, fixed ex uh, exchange rates would there be uh, uh, changes in foreign currency reserves because the central bank uses these currency reserves to maintain um, an exchange rate peg. So the answer to this case is B. There should, there should be no real change in foreign currency reserves and there should be a depreciation by 20%. Um, so 29, um, if it has a surplus and a high uh, inflation level, you can sort of go through all of these. Uh, devaluation of the currency is not going to help because that, if anything, is going to boost the surplus even further and actually lead to import into the Tariffs on imports that's then going to increase imports. Um, and therefore re rebalance the surplus and also lead to a, 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 um, a fall in the rate of inflation. So the answer to that one is D. And finally, um, 30, um, to maintain a balanced budget, we can, um, it's the idea that during a, a boom with, um, as we've touched on before, increasing incomes, uh, tax revenues increase and um, transfer payments such as benefits fall. Um, so in order to sort of uh, address this, the tax rates need to fall. Um, similarly during the slump when there's low incomes, there's low tax revenues to, to increase these taxes. Sorry, uh, apologies for the sound. If you have more than one piece or any large piece of items, or any guests will kindly volunteer to get your hand baggage tags free of charge, please mention this member of staff as you're passing to the gate. Yeah, apologies for that final announcement. Um, but as we can see, when there's a, a slump, um, with incomes falling, there's a, a fall in, in tax revenue, so we need to raise taxes during the slump and lower taxes during the boom. So the answer to 30 in this case is B. Um, well, okay, um, thank you very much for listening. I hope um, I've shed some light on it and you found that paper quite um, interesting. I'll uh, put another recording out for the paper tomorrow. Okay, thank you.